evening. My name is Lemon Jai. This is News Review. Thank you for being there. Today, coming up on the show, the Minister of Defense, in partnership with partners, have begun uh, validating the national defense policy. This is going to be the first ever policy, defense policy of the Gambia, that will inform or help the ministry in having that oversight role of the country's army. Uh, there are also Caritas Gambia, the Catholic uh, Development Office in partnership with the Catholic Relief Services of the Gambia. Today organized a social cohesion peace bantaba at the Gambia Pastoral Institute. Uh, my guest today will be civil society boss, uh, uh, Mr. John Charles Njai. He will be my guest today. We'll talk about the election. We'll also talk about the NPP, APRC Alliance, as well as the the TRRC, it will, the TR, that investigation will submit the report uh, there of their investigation to President Adam Barrow at the end of this month. And um, we understand that the civil society will embark upon a solidarity march as the TRRC submits its report to the president there. Before all of that, let's see quickly what the newspapers are saying. The standard is saying KMC announces $307 million budget for 2021, saying the Carnival Municipal Council yesterday announced it has forwarded its 2022 budget to the Minister of Lands and Regional Government for reviews and comments in accordance with the Local Government Act 2002, saying the budget of, for the year 2020 enc encapsulates all the development services and administrative expenditure cost of the council as well as revenue generation and equitable distribution of council funds amongst various areas for the coming year. According to the statement from the KMC, the council's expected total revenue for the year is projected at $307 million, $372 million is there. Another story on the standard is saying court strikes out suit against Banjul Mayor IEC. A court in Banjul yesterday threw out a suit filed against the mayor of Banjul, Rohi Malik Lo, and the Independent Electoral Commission to have all voter cards or voters' cards issued by the IEC in Banjul that were supported by attestation from the mayor removed from the register, saying the court also ordered the plaintiffs Gambia participate, a civil society organization, Abdul Aziz Gay, councillor of Box Bar Ward in Banjul, and Center for Research and Policy Development to pay $10,000 to Mayor Lowe and another $10,000 to the IEC. The plaintiffs filed a summon last Thursday asking for an order compelling the IEC to produce the list of all voters' voters' cards issued in Banjul that were supported by the attestation forms issued by the mayor. The story went further to say that they also wanted the court to strike out the voter cards or voters' cards from the, that's a typo there, from the electoral rule. In their particulars of claim, the plaintiff said Mayor Lo uh, declared in the High Court that he had issued more than 2,000 attestations to the people of Banjul. According to them, 2,000 is a significant number of those registered in Banjul, and they wanted that uh, number to be cancelled. Let's see the point. One story there is talking about Corporal Samba Bah, the army officer who is battling ill health, saying Corporal Samba Bah of uh, overseas medical treatment transaction on the way, saying Corporal Samba Bah, who recently called on government to facilitate his overseas treatment, has confirmed that a senior health offic official at the Gambia Armed Forces has engaged him over his overseas treatment in India. Yes, we'll leave it at that well, for the newspapers. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Stage one. Now, the Minister of Defense, in partnership with part partners, has begun validating the country's first ever defense policy. That validation, two days actually, it's going to last two days, is happening at the Sadawada Kerava Jawara Conference Center in Bijilo. Marisango reports. The Ministry of Defense today validated the first ever national defense policy 
held at the Sadaudu Karabajora Conference Center. Defense Minister Sheikh Omar Faiz says such policy details the type of military needed to address the threat to the territorial integrity of the Gambia. Today marks the official unveiling of the country's first ever civilian led draft 2021 defense policy of the Gambia and an invitation to gather our most esteemed colleagues from across government to solicit, of course, and civil society to solicit their views, comments, and reactions of a draft document thus far. It is for this reason that, I, that today's event is entitled or is titled the validation of the draft defense policy of the Gambia. That's what we're going to be doing between today and tomorrow, hopefully. This document reflects a truly homegrown and inclusive process. You will all be aware of the effort and in place since 2018 to develop a country's national security policy architecture, for whom which enormously grateful to His Excellency President Adam Barrow's efforts, who laid a critical foundation with his team for this purpose. The process began with, in 2017, security sector assessment exercise, which our Commander-in-Chief and his team called for to analyze the opportunities and challenges that the country face in delivering accountable, transparent, professional, a political and responsive security for our people. This strategic and critical analytical exercise helped to inform the country's first ever national security policy. So the assessment moved to the first ever national security policy, which was published in 2019. The policy articulated national principles, beliefs, and aspirations. The national security policy was the first of its kind and took a broad approach to the concept of national security and based this on all critical aspects of human security. It provided an initial set of intentions and broad national security interests that would inform the general direction of travel for all security relevant ministries, of course, including the Ministry of Defense. The Gambian military has, since the end of former President Jamis' rule, been scheduled for key reforms in line with democratic principles. Army Chief Yanko Wadrami was at the validation of the policy. The absence of a defense policy, to some extent, contributed to the lack of the basic capacities to establish a strong national defense and security structures within the Gambia. It is therefore my considered view that the lack of such fundamental national requirement has the potential to expose the Gambia to security threats and challenges which could have undermined its independence, sovereignty, and development. Remember, when we talk of development in every context, it cannot be achieved in the absence of peace and security. There is a symbiotic relationship between peace, security, and development. If I may put it in a contextual terms, peace without security is not sustainable. And security without peace is not durable. We cannot talk of meaningful development in every context in the absence of peace and security. In other words, it is fine to say there's a clear linkage between peace, security, and sustainable development. And if this is what we aspire as a nation, in my humble opinion, we should all collectively work towards the maintenance of peace and security in this country. It serves our collective best interests as a country. It is also my firm conviction that the Gambia National Defense Policy will serve as a policy framework to harmonize our collective national interests with the available resources in designing strong defense strategies and national security. It is assumed that these will enable the Gambia Armed Forces to possess the right capability of defending the nation territory and her people. The right to do so derives strengths and aspirations from the Constitution. How do we, as an institution, perform such a credible role? 
defend the territorial integrity, and of course, make sure that every Gambians live their dreams in peace and harmony. That is derived from the Constitution. The United Kingdom has been a partner of the Gambia in various areas, including security. David Belgroof, the High Commissioner to the Gambia, expressed his gratitude on behalf of the UK government for partnering with the Gambia Armed Forces on the policy. This is the first time that there will be a defence policy uh, for the Gambia, uh, for the Gambian Armed Forces. And it is particularly special that um, my government, the UK government, have been able to support this. Um, we were at the beginning, at the inception of the Gambian Armed Forces. We partnered with the Gambia at its inception um, when they began the Gambian Armed Forces. So it is a great privilege to partner and continue to partner with the Gambian Armed Forces today. And I'd like to commend the Minister and everybody involved in this initiative. And it is indeed the appropriate time to do this. Um, the Gambia is in a new political era, um, an era where politically we're showing respect for the human rights of its citizens and protects their interests. But as with most work of government and I've been in my government for more years than I care to remember. <laughs> Many more years than I care to remember. But everything starts with the policy. Um, you know, without the policy, which sets the parameters of what you do, it's very difficult to move on. It's very difficult to have the objectives uh, and the goals, unless you've got the parameters, the, the political parameters in which to operate. So it's very, this document is very important. Um, and the purpose of the policy, it sets the directions of what the government does on behalf of its citizens. And from that flows everything else, the strategy, the actual operations. So this is such an important piece of work and I'm very glad that we've been able to support it. And I'd like to thank our defence attaché, uh, Colonel Charles Cooper, who's worked so hard to make sure that the resources were available for this. The validation of the defence policy on Tuesday is indeed evidence government is engaged in the efforts aimed at reforming the country's security sector. Officials will now look forward to the launch of the policy. Matis Senghor, TFN News View. Now, Caritas Gambia and the Catholic Development Office, CADO, in partnership with the Catholic Relief Services of, of the Gambia, organized a social cohesion peace bandama today. This, is, uh, this event there was held at the Gambia Pastoral Institute, and it is coming as a way of marking World Peace Day 2021. Farakamara tells us more. The Social Cohesion Bantaba was organized by Caritas Gambia and the Catholic Development Office in partnership with Catholic Relief Services. This came about following a, a study that was done by the government of the Gambia, the United Nations Development Program and Civil Society. Uh, when a conflict and development analysis was done and the, the findings point to certain issues that if left unaddressed, have the potential to push this country into conflict. The Peace Bantaba was to mark World Peace Day 2021. Reverend Father Edu Gomez explains the importance of peace. Peace in the world. Why do we seek for peace in the world? Or why the United Nations venture for peace in the world? Number one is for the unity and goodwill purpose of the world. The unity and goodwill purpose of the world. The unity of the world meaning that all over the world we see ourselves as one, not as enemies, but as collaborators, friends, and associates. So that whatever we do in our individual countries 
we view it from a universal point of view, seeing the world, as we now say, as a global village. Secondly, why peace in the world? This is because of normality in life, social life, religious life, life at work, life in international sports or local sports, etc., etc. The Bantaba was attended by officials from political parties as well as the civil society. All People's Party Chief Dr. Ibrahim Jang took part in the Bantaba. We are aware of the potential of trouble, chaos, uh, and uh, 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 insecurity in this country going forward. And uh, I can overemphasize how this meeting is of paramount importance. Political party leaders are also being advised to sensitize their supporters about peace and its importance. I think as political parties, it is very important that we sensitize our people to remain peaceful. The Gambia will remain the Gambia. Whether we turn it upside down, we will still come back to the same Gambia. This is where we are born. This is where our parents were born. This is where our children are. This is where our, our, our parents live. So we should endeavor as a people to make sure that we keep the peace. Gambians will head to the polls in less than 80 days to vote in a presidential election. There is anxiety of violence and projects such as this will go a long way in ensuring the process is peaceful and conflict-free. Fatou Kamara reporting for the Fatou Network News Review. Tough Africa Global brings you exquisite yet affordable state-of-the-art commercial rental spaces available at Mandiba Mall located at Bluefoot Gardens Estate. These commercial spaces come with facilities such as 24-hour security, standby backup generator, air conditioned spaces, conference room and personal cash power meters. If you are looking for a spacious and suitable business environment, look no further. Madiba Mall retail and commercial spaces are just what you need. Call us today and reserve a space. For more information, please call 733 or 594-1053 or you can send an email to info at toughafricaglobal.com Thank you very much. So joining me on the show today is Mr. John Charles Njai. He's the chairman of the Civil Society Coalition of the Gambia. He's the boss of the Civil Society. <laughs> Mr. Njai, thank you for joining me on the show. Uh, thank you, Lamin, for having me. Elections or presidential election is just less than 80 days away. Mm. How prepared is the civil society? Massive role on your hand. Well, yes, uh, we are very conscious that there is a lot um, the civil society has to do. And um, we are preparing. Uh, we um, are working with our partners. We are also working on the ground, uh, the youth groups, the CSO coalition and elections are all ready to observe the elections. I believe this will be one election um, in this country that will have uh, an observer in every polling station. This was not possible in 2016, but this year we will be able to roll out observers all throughout the country um, by the grace of God. And the, the, the CSOs are ready. The youth group, the, the youth um, are very much passionate mm -hmm. about, about um, the elections and are going to uh, massively participate not only to vote, but also to observe the elections and play a role, um, as it were, to support the IEC uh, to be referees and uh, impartial players in the, in, in, the, in the elections. Would you take that to be your observation in terms of the, all the movements that are taking place? I mean, yeah. I mean this is turning out to be a do-or-die sort, of sort of an election. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to win. Yeah. I mean... At the level of the civil society, what have you observed in terms of political parties and their activities? Well, I think um, it is uh, clear that a lot of um, unsavory remarks are going on. And uh, we continue to appeal to our politicians to, to be civil in the discourse. I think we need to look at the elections as bringing the ideas on the table for the Gambian people to make a choice. It's not about individuals. It's not 
uh, about sending words and insulting each other. We should mature from that kind of a politics to a politics where our leaders are able to bring issues on the table and are able to convince the voters to vote for them. And let me also be quick to say, in elections, it's not compulsory for everybody to vote for you. So whether you are incumbent, you are opposition, it's not by force. It is a choice of the people. And the people can only make a good choice when they know what you have to offer. And that is what we as a people and civil society are appealing to political parties and the political leaders, the presidential aspirants to do. Bring your uh, manifesto, your plans for development, bring it on the table and let the Gambian people decide. This issue of unsavory comments or, or, or remarks, mm -hmm. what has, I mean, the, at the level of the civil society, why do you think this is happening in our country? I mean, everyone is talking about it. Everyone mm -hmm. is talking about the issue of people insulting one another just because of I mean, politics. Well, I, I think I would say it's just uh, political immaturity. And again, maybe it is uh, also it's telling us that possibly our leaders don't have substance. Because if I have enough substance within me, I will have very little time to talk about individuals. I talk about the issues. I talk about my plans. So if my plans are concrete and my plans cannot be talked about in an hour, in two hours, every minute I have, I'll be talking about my plans. I will not have time to talk about any other thing. So uh, I, I believe there is a lot of political immaturity. And let me also be quick to say, political maturity doesn't come with how much time you've spent in the political field. It just uh, has to do with your outlook. What are you bringing on the table? And if we look at politics and bring our leaders to that place, then we will be able to know who is matured and who is not matured. Because any leader that keeps talking about people and uh, keep, keeps insulting, talking about religion, tribe, and all these mundane things, then I don't think you're ready to lead the country. And how about the citizens? Don't you also think that the citizens are also not, not interested in issues? What they are largely interested in is non-issues. That is what resonates with them. And politicians are simply well, well, using that. The, the citizens are supposed to be led by the leaders. The citizens look up to leadership. So whether the citizens want this, but it's like you have your child at home. If your child wants things that are not good for the child, are you saying because your child wants it well, your children are the majority in your home? No. So you follow? No. The leaders must set the pace. And that is what we must demand of our leaders to do the right thing in political rallies. Let them make sure that the, the rhetoric is civil. It is building and bringing us together rather than dividing us. Yes. Also, when you look at uh, the, the, there has been growth, proliferation mm -hmm. of people who are interested in the job of president. You consider that growth? Uh, well, I, 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 I would say so. I well, say yeah, so. well. Uh, what does the civil society mm -hmm. have to say about that? Well, recently, we have seen even the likes of... Um, as I fall. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the thing is, I keep telling people, Gambia has a four-year-old democracy. Forget what happened 30 years ago. Because, you know, they said it's easy to build. Yes. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to build, but it's easy to destroy. So let's say what has been built 30 years ago has been destroyed in 22 years. So we are building again. And for us to have democracy and uh, practice democracy in, uh, with the ideals of democracy, that we hope for. In four years, we cannot get it. And all you're seeing is people are testing the waters. After some time, there will be settlement. After some time, the people that are now coming, everybody thinking they could be president. When reality hits and you go to the polls and maybe you draw 5%, 10%, or even 2% of the votes, then you know that politics is not just for everybody. One, you will know that, well, you are not as famous as you thought you were. And the reality begins to dawn. So it's okay for people to do that. It's just that, again, it, it becomes very messy. It also, with a, um, a population with a very high illiteracy rate, yes. it confuses the people. Mm -hmm. It makes some people believe that, well, everybody is just out to get power. So maybe sincerity is not all there. But we must be patient. 
Let's allow everybody to come, as many as can come, and let's see, let's test our democracy. How about the fear in some quarters that there could be violence? Mm -hmm. I mean, some people say you, they, they can see signs of violence. Mm -hmm. At the level of the civil society, uh, I mean, are you at all aware of some of these fears? Yeah. Some, some we, of the things that people are saying? We are aware and we are concerned. What the reason why we have the fears is one, it's the way uh, our politicians are looking at this. It's almost like you said, a do or die thing. Politics should not be a do or die. It's you get into the game, you either win or you lose. At the end of the day, the country wins. Mm -hmm. So because of the tensions, because of the rhetoric, because of um, the anger, that's why people think that there would be uh, we, would, we would not have a peaceful election. But I am convinced and I believe that if we keep talking to each other, if our politicians stop talking against each other and begin to talk to each other, we will have peaceful elections. And us, the citizens, we have much more to lose. I, I have gone around the country and I kept telling people that if anything happens, these leaders and their families, there will be nowhere to be found. We will be on the ground. So why would we allow ourselves to be dragged into fights in the streets for our leaders when our leaders will go untouched and unbruised. So let us wise up as Gambians and know that this is our country. If this country is destroyed, we are contending with healthcare, agriculture and all these things. If it's destroyed, remember, we, it's like you've gone 2% and you destroy the 2%, you will go back to minus something. So let's not even bother to think or to uh, yes. bring ourselves to a place that we, we have a chaotic nation. It will not be good for us. This code of conduct thing, mm -hmm. that idea, this international organization have been in the country since the start of this transition. Mm -hmm. And they've been quite supportive in yeah. helping the country transition move. Yeah. Um, in our democracy, they, they, they intend on drawing mm -hmm. a code of conduct. Yeah for all the political or, or the candidates, the candidates yeah. to, to sign up to. Mm -hmm. And the civil society has been integral, has yeah. been part of that. Yeah. Yeah. What can you, from civil society point of, point of view, mm -hmm. what can you tell us about that? Do you think that is a good idea at all? I think it is a very um, noble idea and a very noble initiative. Uh, there is the code of conduct of the inter-party committee. But what this code of conduct seeks to do is to bring the presidential aspirants to agree to certain uh, a certain way of operating during the elections, to agree to certain standards that they will hold each other accountable to and the nation can hold them accountable to. And I believe it, it is um, a way of engaging. And also it could be the yardstick that we the citizens use to gauge our politicians. Are they people of their word? They have signed up to this. Uh, are they going to keep it? And what we are also going to do Towards the um, writing of, of the or the uh, bringing together of the code of conduct, we're going to engage the citizens to tell us what they think. So it's not a code of conduct drafted from outside, but the citizens must participate. What do they think we must hold our our leaders accountable for? And two, what standards do we want to bring for our leaders? And that I and I and I believe it's a it's a very noble initiative, and we must for it to work. We as citizens must be ready to look at it and hold it to the face of our politicians. You sign this, what you violated, or you are at the brink of violating. And I think that will also help to bring peace um, and get us through a peaceful election. The role of the IEC in this election mm -hmm. is massive. Yeah. It is the most important stakeholder in this election. Yeah. And they have to serve this quite well. Yeah. Otherwise, that is that tendency of, of conflict, of, mm -hmm. a, of, a, of a huge crisis. Yeah. What is the civil society doing in terms of engaging the IEC mm -hmm. for the IEC to appreciate its own role more and better? Yeah, I, we, we've had a series of engagements with the IEC. The IEC has invited civil society recently and the media, and we keep in touch. I mean, I am always, um, almost always in touch with the CEO and the vice chair, and they are very open to criticisms. I mean, we can talk and chat, oh, what, what is going on here and there? And again, that's why we have the civil, um, the civil society observer groups that will be on the ground. Because let's not leave everything to IEC. We must complement 
the efforts of the IEC support in being referees. Um, civil society are neutral players in this. Uh, yes, people have their personal things, but when it comes to civil society as a whole, we also add to the referee. So that's why we have the independent observers to be on the ground. So we can call IEC to order, we can call the political parties to order, we can call the security forces uh, to order. And that is why I believe that we will have a peaceful election because uh, we are not leaving IEC to do everything. We are going to support them where we believe there are gaps, there are challenges. Our role is not to just sit and criticize, but to support them, to uh, give them all the necessary support because we must ensure that the country uh, goes through a peaceful election. The activities of the various political parties, we have seen all of them making one move or the other, mm. political move or the other. Mm. I mean, you talk about the NPP, the ruling NPP, mm. National People's Party of the President. Mm. They have made their own movements. Mm. APRC deciding to join NPP mm. in the form of an alliance. This triggered a lot of uh, talk. Mm. From civil society perspective, point of view, what has been the reaction in terms of because I know people have reacted variously. You have people condemning this marriage. Yeah. You know, I keep saying that um, as civil society, we are referees in a way. A referee doesn't criticize the teams that are going to play but a match. But you have a lot of activists yeah, well, yeah, who, but, who but, criticize them. Yeah, but you know, civil society, <laughs> you must look at civil society from also a leadership perspective. Yeah. Civil society has a leadership. And sometimes if you want to understand civil society, you look to the leadership yes. and what the leadership is saying and doing for you to have um, a perspective of what civil society thinks about certain things. There are, we, we may have our personal feelings concerning certain things. A referee can have his feelings concerning teams. Mm -hmm. But once you articulate your feelings concerning the teams you are going to referee, then the integrity of your refereeing would be questioned. So it is better for civil society to stay away from talking about the alliances, whether to support or go against alliances. But for civil society, to look at what is most critical. What is most critical to us as civil society is that the recommendations of the TRRC are implemented. And those recommendations are going to be implemented by government. We are a country of rule and law, of rule of law. We are a country with a constitution. No single individual. Gambians will not allow any individual to hijack this country again or even any single political party. Even if you are the controlling government, the Gambians are aware enough, civil society is aware enough, the public is aware enough to hold our governments accountable. So we are waiting for the TRRC recommendations to come out. We are going to stand in support and in solidarity with the recommendations, and we are going to hold government accountable to implementing those recommendations because we stand, we stand with the victims. We empathize with the victims. And the blood of no innocent Gambian must be shed in vain. So we, have, we will fight for that, we will stand for that, and we will ensure that the recommendations are implemented in this country. In fact, I was, my next question was going to be on that, because the issue of NPP-APRC alliance, you have a lot of people who pushed back at it, who, yeah. who, who condemned it. The, 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 and it's their right to do so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, but they are claiming or arguing that this is uh, going to present problems for the, for the victims in terms of getting justice. I mean, the victims, there was an investigation by the TRRC, and now you have NPP aligned with the party of the former president. So a lot of people So let me ask a question that. to people that say that. What guarantees do we have that President Barrow would win? Who said he's going to win? It's left to the Gambian people to decide. And if the Gambian people decide that he wins and he messes up, then the Gambian people will have to take responsibility. But I'm also saying we as civil society are not going to stand by for anybody to have spent so much in a TRRC and then people do, we, we just ditch the report. It's not going to happen. Not in our lifetime. But and what do you me, see? Do you see commitment on the part of the government in the, ensuring? We, we wrote to the, the president in June. What did he say? And uh, he, he has committed to, to supporting the recommendations and working and, and supporting the TRRC process. He has committed to that. I have a letter to that effect. So all, that these, all this noise then would be misplaced? 
Well, you know, that's why I keep say, telling people there are things that I know and there, are, there is information that I have that, that, they don't that would, would, would guide my, my decisions. And I told the civil society body that if I have this, I have to give government the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. I have to give the president the benefit of the doubt mm -hmm. because I wrote to him, he wrote back to me as leader of civil society and saying they are committed to the TRRC process. So I take him for his word. Also, now the, 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 the report will be submitted at the end of the month. Yeah. And now the re reports are saying mm -hmm. that you intend on embarking on a solidarity march yeah. to ensuring, to give it more weight. Yes, you, we, like. we, had a, we, we have a roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, we call it a post-TRRC roadmap for civil society, how we want to engage in the process. And part of that is one, we want to sensitize the Gambian public. We don't want the TRRC report to go out um, in obscurity. We want the Gambian public to pay attention that this is going to happen. We want to also take the time to commend the commissioners of the TRRC and the whole team for a job well done. We also um, want to state and, um, a stance and a position that we civil society, we stand with the victims at this time, we stand with the victims going forward, and we want to see the um, recommendations that are made coming from the TRRC, we want to see them implemented. You want to see that implemented. Let us also talk about uh, the, I mean, election is December, yeah. then you will have the nomination. Would you play any role in that, civil society? What nomination? The nomination of the candidates. That, that's in October? Yes. Yeah, well, we, we are going to observe the entire process. The entire process. We are going to entire, um, observe the entire process. But apart from that, there is a lot that is going on, uh, whether it is OneEP, whether it is um, CRS, Caritas, whether it is uh, what we are doing at the TJ Working Group, whether it's Tango. There is a lot of um, engagement. There is, uh, I know Gambia participates, Peace Ambassadors. You, I mean, you will be amazed at the level of work that is ongoing, whether it's peace building, talking about social cohesion, whether it is um, getting people out to register to vote, whether it is getting ready for observers to observe the elections. Civil society is doing tremendous work. I think what we need to do now is to have um, a coordinated report as to the input of civil society at this time. But I can guarantee you that civil society is doing a lot to, uh, to ensure that these elections are free fair, transparent, and peaceful. Uh, partners also forthcoming in terms yeah, of support? Yeah, we, well, we have, a, we have partners that are coming. Uh, yes, you could do with much more partners, or you could do much more, but uh, we have a lot of good partners that are coming up. Uh, we're still talking to some. I know people, partners that are still interested in supporting uh, what we are doing in civil society. Sir John, thank you very much okay. as always. Thank you, Lamy, thank you for, for taking having... some time to yeah. be with us here. Thank you. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thank you. That is uh, John Charles Njai. He's the uh, leader of the country's civil society. He was my guest today. Uh, with that, we'll come to the end of today's show. Thank you for being there. We'll be back tomorrow.